Welcome back to Assessment Joining the Dots. We are GL Assessment or GL Education, depending on where you are in the world. We're the leading provider of formative standardised assessments in the UK and Ireland and work with schools in over 100 countries worldwide. We're doing this podcast because we're passionate about supporting teaching and learning by supporting all of you to make the best use of the insights from your data. You'll find some reoccurring segments like our data spotlights, where we demystify commonly used terminology in standardised assessments and educational data. Whether you're using our assessments or not, we hope that this podcast is for you. If you're in education and feel like you could do with knowing a bit more about assessment, we're going to discuss topics that matter to you. Thank you so much for supporting us and tuning in to listen to episode three of Assessment Joining the Dots. I'm Helen Robinson, Head of Customer Experience at GL. So my team and I have a focus on improving the experience of using our assessments, which extends far beyond assessment sittings. Through training, webinars, consultations and general support, our aim is to help teachers and senior leaders, or in fact anyone involved in using assessments in their school, to get the most out of their assessments, to impact on teaching and learning, so that pupils can get the most out of their assessments too. We want to enable our customers to be evidence and data informed in decision making to support pupils to achieve their very best. Today, our focus is on well-being and inclusion, and we're going to kick the episode off with an insightful interview with Matthew Savage, a highly experienced and well-traveled education consultant who we have worked with on numerous occasions over many years. He believes passionately in allowing all children to be seen, be heard, be known and belong. With a long and varied career in school leadership, both in the UK and internationally, he now works closely with schools across the globe with a focus on well-being and helping schools to use data wisely and well. So welcome, Matthew Savage, speaker, trainer, coach, governor. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself before we get started and, and your background in education? Absolutely, Helen. But I was in international school leadership and indeed leadership in, in the UK for almost 25 years. My last role was as the head teacher of an award-winning international school in the Middle East. I've been working with and alongside GL for over 10 years now, um, I think, as well. And now I'm a, an independent consultant. I, I help and support school leaders across the world explore what I call the intersection of well-being and DEIJ through the prism of triangulated warm and street data. So basically, I, I work with schools to help them use data wisely and well as a, as a tool for, for healing as opposed to a tool for harm. Lovely. And uh, just for those of us who maybe aren't familiar with DIJ, can you just elaborate on that a little bit for us? So efforts throughout the international school sector to address diversity, equity, inclusion, justice and belonging to wrestle with centuries old problems of inequity and injustice. I think that that movement is growing in volume and in scope and in breadth. And I don't think we can talk about well-being without talking about diversity, equity, inclusion and justice, just as it works the other way. I don't think we can talk about the DIJ or DIJB without also talking about well-being. So I think that they are, like so many things, they are inextricably connected. Absolutely. And from your point of view, why is it most important to put well-being first? Well, for me, it just seems obvious. But I'm aware increasingly that just because something seems obvious to me doesn't mean it seems obvious to everybody else. I, I think to me, one of the main reasons is because nothing matters more. I, I shared a, a Young Minds post on LinkedIn recently, which simply said that there's nothing more important than your mental health. And I I think the mental health of us as individuals, the, the mental health of our uh, community is more important than anything else. So in schools, I think we have to put well-being first for that reason. I also think the well-being and mental health of children and young people today is massively under threat. I think the kids are not okay. And there is so much data to show us uh, how that situation is deteriorating rather than getting better. And thirdly, because if kids are happier, put really simply, then they do better. So even 
uh, those of us in the sector who uh, want better results, right? Even governments who want better results. If we invest in well-being first, academics thrive. But if we put academics first, then well-being with us. So in a sense, it's a bit of a no-brainer. Very well put. And yeah, obviously in our work together, I've, I've heard you tell large captivated audiences the same messages and, and they always, always realize that that would be such a strong way forward. And it makes sense that actually if you're putting the well-being of learners first before academic successes, then it kind of makes sense that the academics will follow. But if you're putting the academics first ahead of prioritizing well-being, then well-being is, is likely to suffer, as, as you say. Why do you think it's difficult to measure well-being? I think there are lots of reasons, to be honest with you, but to pick a few... I think there's a problem of turning anything into an abstraction. So by abstraction, I mean often a letter or a number that is intended to represent the thing. Now, well-being is such a complex, rich, deep, shifting, plastic concept that as soon as we turn it into a number through measuring it, we're actually robbing it of much of its essence and therefore much of its meaning. So I think we need to be mindful and cognizant of that. I think also, to borrow uh, the language of environmental systems uh, and, and the work of the Bateson um, Institute, what we're seeing in terms of well-being issues or challenges or problems in our schools is simply what is emergent. It's what is above the surface, right? What lies beneath the surface, what lies in the soil, is the reasons why that particular state of well-being has emerged. So it's difficult because often we're measuring the emergent, whereas what we need to be wrestling with is the submerged, the soil, if you like. I also think it's difficult because as soon as we try to measure a child's well-being, we're requiring them to feel safe and comfortable enough to be authentic and honest about how they're feeling. And I think our system incentivizes uh, masks and mask wearing. So... For us to ask uh, and to expect our children somehow to just shed all those masks and say, actually, this is how I'm feeling. I think that is a big ask. And we need to, again, be aware of that so we can address that in any measurement strategy. And, and lastly, I suppose, well-being has been siloed for too long. There are cow paths, if you like, that we've trodden in education for as long as there has been formal education. And those put academics first. Even this time of year, schools, social media feeds across the world are trumpeting the number of kids who got straight A stars or uh, got their 45 in the IB or are going off to Russell Group or Ivy League schools. So the, 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 uh, uh, the fabric of a school's messaging and communication says something very different from what we know we need to do in relation to putting well-being first and measuring it. So I think the odds are against us, but I do think that we can address those challenges and I do think we can measure it. Thank you for that. And particularly what you said there around wearing masks, I can really identify with, and I'm sure lots of people, children and adults can identify with that. I certainly wore masks when I was a teenager and I was not okay at school. I wouldn't have felt comfortable actually sort of flagging that for myself, talking to a teacher and just coming out with it. But I do think I would have been honest with a computer server. I think for some reason I would have found it easier to be honest in that way. And we hear that a lot from schools using our past survey, People Attitudes to Self in School. It's an all-age survey that essentially helps schools to understand students' mindsets towards school how they feel about themselves as learners and their school environment, sort of understanding if they're confident, ready and motivated to learn. So it helps identify barriers to learning in order to ensure student wellbeing and, and positive outcomes. And uh, the analysis is given at whole school, class and individual levels so you can really understand those different levels of the data. How can schools overcome some of those challenges in, in measuring well-being? I think firstly, a school needs to be intentional and authentic in putting well-being first. If it puts well-being first alongside putting 101 other things first, 
then kids are pretty aware that that is the case and that their well-being does not matter to the school above all else, right? So first of all, we've really got to be intentional and authentic about putting well-being first. We also need to measure well-being in, in as many different ways as possible. Now, I'm a big fan of the PASS survey. It was a bit, bit of an epiphany to me when I first discovered it 10 or so years ago. And you said you would have been more honest, perhaps, with that than you would in one-to-one -one conversation. Absolutely, yeah. But then for every child who is like you, there will be many, many other children who would have felt more comfortable in a conversation or others who would have felt more comfortable through some sort of check-in software. And I think that we have to be nuanced and we have to be holistic about the way in which we measure well-being. I talk about what I call the well-being data wheel, which consists of uh, observational data and check-in data and survey data and counselling data and, and literally everything else. The idea that all data is well-being data, I think, is a really important thing um, to understand. I also think we need to recognise that there is a well-being ecosystem in the school. And so even once we have measured well-being through one mechanism, we need to understand that any well-being issue does not exist in isolation and we can't pluck it out of its context. It exists as, as part of a really complex well-being ecosystem. And we need to understand that, just as we need to understand the soil from which it has emerged. I also think if we are going to ask kids to be honest, they need to believe that we put well-being first, which goes back to my earlier point about us actually needing to do so. <laughs> they need to understand that the mechanism we're using, such as the past survey, is intended to help us understand their well-being better. They need to trust that any data, therefore, they provide will be safe, will be protected, will be used for good and not for ill. They need to trust in the confidentiality of it wherever possible. And lastly, they need to see impact. And I suppose the last thing I'd say about how we overcome some of those challenges is what do we do with that data once we've got it? Well, we recognize that it's part of a data constellation. That past data is one star in that constellation, but there are many other stars uh, besides. We need to find dashboards which will bring that constellation together and present it in such a way that a student level, a class level, a school level, the users, i.e. the educators and leaders, can actually use it and, and turn it into impact. And we need to ensure that we never lose the fact that all of this well-being data we're gathering is helping us to read the story of the child in front of us in our class. So if we remember that, that that's what it's about, we need to read this child's story. We need to help them to feel safe to take off some of those masks. If we never lose sight of that, then the measurement of well-being can be absolutely a force for good. Lovely. And I've heard you talk before about how sometimes working in school is is like digging for treasure without a map on, on a vast sandy, sandy beach. But when you've got data, good quality data, it's like flags in the sand have appeared and suddenly you know where to dig. And I think we certainly find that with, with the past data when we're talking to schools, going back to your well-being data wheel, actually the past data is those flags in the sand to know where to look. And quite often the first bit of advice we can give is, is to have a follow-up conversation with students. So taking in more than just the survey data um, and taking in more of that well-being data wheel and particularly I know you mentioned dashboards something that we've been working really hard on the past few years is our GL data dashboard which then combines past data with any other assessment data if you're using more more than one of our assessments so that you can really understand that data as, as a piece of the puzzle uh, and not as as a standalone so just finally I'd really like to know from you what's the most effective strategy or approach to to focusing on and improving students well-being in school that you've seen with your extensive work with schools across the world well-being in schools is complicated and complex and therefore there is never um, only one approach which will somehow be the silver bullet the panacea the thing that makes things better but i think that there needs to be the capacity to support 
the well-being needs that the measurement of well-being will unearth. And that's, I think, where schools often trip up. So one example I would give is the size and capacity of the school's counselling team. The International School Counselors Association recommends a ratio of one qualified, licensed, experienced counsellor for every 250 kids. And most schools are nowhere near that. So anything that schools can do to increase that capacity to be able to support the well-being needs that are highlighted or flagged by this well-being data has to be a good thing. And, and even, you know, reducing the contact time of uh, pastoral leaders and heads of year so that they also have more time and more capacity to, to do this. So I think, as with so many things in schools, whatever you can do to create more time for kids actually to feel that there's someone that they can go and talk to, someone with whom they feel safe to talk, and the time actually to have those conversations. I think that's probably one of the most important things. Matty, thank you so much for joining us today to talk about such an important area. And I'm sure you will have inspired many more educators out there to find a way to start chipping away at this age-old problem of actually we, we need to put well-being first if our learners are to succeed and thrive. Thank you very much, Helen. It was a, a pleasure to have this chat with you today about something that is so important for all of the children in all of our schools. So we are now moving into our Data Spotlight Explainer, designed to demystify data and assessment terminology. I'll now hand over to Emma and Darren to explain PASS. Well, welcome to this section of the podcast. I'm Darren. I'm today going to be talking to Emma, who is a previous SENCO and inclusion lead from primary and secondary. Welcome, Emma. I'm really interested to find out. You must have used so much data in your previous roles. What led you to specifically using the past surveys? We certainly did. Uh, we knew a lot about a learner and how they were progressing so academically. We understood about their attainment. And for me, it was about really understanding the wider learner profile. And a lot of that comes from quantitative data, doesn't it? And qualitative for me was equally important. And so, you know, understanding all aspects of a learner and how they were accessing their learning and feeling successful uh, was really important. So having something like the past became a central part of the puzzle for me because it helped to shine a light on parts of the learner that you might ordinarily miss. Yeah, we speak to a lot of teachers who obviously know their pupils really well and they're probably thinking to themselves, why would I actually need to use PASS? I pretty much know most that I need to know about pupils. So what would you say is unique about PASS? I think you're right. Teachers probably feel like they do know their children really well. But I think having as much information available as possible just helps to kind of corroborate was my kind of approach to uh, building that hypothesis of need from a SEND perspective. But PASS is really useful for all learners because it's a really quick and easy to administer digital survey that helps to, I suppose, paint a picture of learners, uh, you know, their thoughts and feelings about themselves and their school experience. We're very aware, I know we're both parents and as well as kind of knowing how colleagues are working in school, that children and young people are not always open books. They can do a really great job of uh, of hiding their feelings, can't they? And sort of masking those challenges that they experience with all manner of different strategies. So for me and for my colleagues, using PASS helped us to really get a better understanding of each of those individual learners and how they're really feeling. So it made it much easier to sort of flag individuals that were in need of some pastoral support. Um, but also, actually, it was really helpful from a bigger picture. So from an inclusion lead perspective, thinking about uh, the strategic approach to how we might adjust our school's climate and culture over time. Yeah, I think it's a really important point you picked up on there, understanding each individual learner as much as you can. We've heard that from from teachers and colleagues alike. What specific information would you say you got from the past survey and how did you use it? So one of the things that I really liked about the past reporting and still do is the fact that it provides three layers or three levels of data for those learners who completed the survey. So I can look at whole cohort. 
I can target in on a specific group that might be vulnerable. So maybe my uh, learners with additional needs and learning differences. And then I can focus on the individual. Uh, and the RAG scale made that process really quick and easy to spot those that might be finding things a bit of a challenge. So then we were able to think about those individual learners and those groups and cohort and how that might then compare with other cohorts, both within our own school and those externally. So thinking about that standardized data picture and how did that compare for the learners within our setting. And the survey uses nine factors that help us to really understand the different aspects uh, of the learning experience uh, and perceptions of those experiences. They included things like confidence for learning, and attitudes to attendance. And of course, we know that attendance is so important at the moment, don't we? And then myself and my colleagues could use all of that really valuable data and the intervention resources that we got with PASS to prioritise the best ways to support those children. So Emma, you mentioned before that learners often mask the way they're feeling. You don't always get the true picture. Um, so with that in mind, how can you actually monitor the support that you have put in place and whether it's actually making a difference? Well, actually, for me at the time when I was using PASS, that was a bit of a, a, an admin challenge because it meant I needed to run two reports and then combine the data from those Excel reports in order to compare changes. So it was possible for me to do. But now, you know, and I wish I had it then, there's a great pass over tie report that does that for you. So you can absolutely have a look at the difference that you might be making. So that report can include results from two or three pass surveys side by side on the same uh, report. And you get a nice little change indicator so you can quickly and easily identify any changes uh, in those past results in order to monitor the impact of your intervention. And now on to our light bulb moments. This week from Debbie Bailey, CEO of Neat Academy Trust, with special thanks from us for sharing their story. The light bulb moments allow us to share your stories to understand the power of data. Perhaps you know already how you can get the most from your assessments, or perhaps you'll learn something new and be able to take something away from the stories shared. What was the moment you realised the power of your GL assessment data? What difference did it make to you or your learners? What did you learn? What problem did it help you to solve? My name is Debbie Bailey. I'm CEO of NEAT Academy Trust. Our light bulb moment was related to GL assessment PASS. The PASS assessment has supported us in identifying young people across our trust who may be um, more vulnerable to struggling at transition point from Key Stage 2 to Key Stage 3. So we've used PASS to identify those young people um, whose assessment scores in particular areas are significantly lower than peers. What we've been able to do then is to employ a youth worker to work with the young people in the primary schools on those specific areas of need. So, for example, it might be about around building their own resilience. And then also the youth worker has been able to follow them up into their secondary school and continue the work. This is the first year that we've seen the project through from primary into secondary. Um, 12 young people transitioned into our secondary school who we'd identified through our past assessments. And out of those, there were three who'd self-identified as wanting a little bit more support and two that teachers within our secondary schools felt would benefit from more support. Um, to date, all of those young people continue to be supported and are doing really well in our, in our secondary school. So to get involved, it's really easy. All you need to do is send us a WhatsApp voice note with your contribution to 07917516515. Many thanks to all who have sent their voice notes in so far. We have loved listening back to these and look forward to sharing more next time. Thanks for joining us for our third Assessment Joining the Dots podcast. If you would like any more information from us, please head to our training and support site, support.gl-assessment.co.uk or support.gl-education.com, depending on where you are in the world. You can tweet us at at gl underscore assessment or at gl underscore education and email us if you'd like to know more or contribute 
We'd love to hear from you. The email address is podcast at gl-assessment.co.uk. Please follow our podcast on whichever platform you're listening to us on. Subscribe to be notified when new episodes are available. It would be amazing if you shared this with your friends and colleagues on social media and rate our podcast. Join us next time for our look back on the year with our special guest from TeacherTap. Thanks again for joining us. See you again next time.